This morning we are looking at a familiar passage of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And there's two things that we can be impressed with, with this familiar incident, and that is Jesus' ability to provide as well as his compassion for others. The parallel passages, each of the Gospels records this account. Uh, John 6, 1 through 14 is what we're looking at this morning, but it is also recorded in Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21, Mark 6, 32 to 44, and Luke 9, 10 to 17. And what we find here is, as John records this account is Jesus and his disciples in a remote place. As John 6, 1 through 4 states, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. The Sea of Galilee is known as also the Sea of Tiberias as well as the Sea of Kinneroth. And around this sea, the Jews that lived in Galilee often uh, collected in, in crowds. Uh, several towns or villages uh, sprang up on its shores, and the chief of those was a Capernaum, which after Jesus began his public ministry seems to have uh, been made, Capernaum seems to have been made his, his home so far as he had a home here on earth. Capernaum was situated on the western shore of, of the sea. And now the reason for being there, Matthew's account tells us uh, something that Jesus had heard, Matthew 14, 1 to 13, where that text begins, at that time Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servant, uh, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these mirac uh, mir miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison. And there he goes on and, and Matthew reveals the, the account of, of the, the um, death of John the Baptist, of him being uh, beheaded. And then verse 12 we read, And his disciples came, that is John's disciples, John, his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And then we have the account of the feeding of the 5,000. Mark's account tells us of the need for some rest, as Mark 6, 30 to 32 uh, states, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Now Mark's account, it, it, from Mark's account, it appears the disciples were returning from ministry, and, and they were excited about that uh, as they'd gone through the towns, and as well as John notes of him hearing this news about uh, John the Baptist's death or, or that uh, Herod was, was looking for him, thinking that perhaps he was John the Baptist raised from the, the dead. Uh, um, and so receiving this news, the disciples coming back at the same time, looking at Mark 6, 7 to 13 and, and Mark um, 6, 14 to 29. And so with such news coming uh, to him and the crowds continuing uh, to seek him so that they didn't have uh, time, even leisure to, to eat, uh, there was need for time alone. There was time to refresh. But, but Jesus sees the crowds coming and even in spite of the, their own personal need, he has compassion on the crowds. Now, the reason for the crowds coming, perhaps they were on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover that was at hand, according to the accounts. Or they were following because they um, merely loved this wonder worker or to see the works of, of Jesus, the miracles uh, of Jesus. They were impressed with what Jesus uh, could do. And, and uh, John's account tells us uh, that is a reason for following because of the signs that he was doing on the sick. And so we turn to the scene here. 
We consider the, the crowds coming. But there was a great crowd, and there was a great need. And where we begin here is with the question of provision, John 6, verses 5 through 9. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing the large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii would, uh, worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew the miracle that he was going to perform. He knew how he was going to feed this crowd, but he tested. And I can't help but wonder if Jesus wasn't trying to draw the attention of the disciples to their own inadequacy to then reveal his adequacy, which they would need to keep in mind as they continued through uh, their, their ministry. A teaching opportunity for his disciples. And sometimes I believe that we need to wrestle with that ourselves. You'll wrestle with, with the question. You know, when we come face to face with our limitations, our attention ought to be drawn toward the one who has no limitations. Many times we must be brought to, to that point to recognize our great need for God's help. We can't do it all ourselves. There's the need to recognize inadequacy before we are then able to sometimes recognize divine strength to accept the help that God provides. You know, when, whenever anyone reaches a point where they think that they can do it all themselves, then God seems to be ignored. And one begins to be uh, puffed up in, in, in himself, but we must always recognize our inadequacy, but as we look to the Lord for his adequacy in, in working the works that he desires to work. But we have the human perspective here. First, Philip's a perspective. As Philip saw, you know, that, that would take a lot of money to feed these people. He looked at the crowd and, and he made his calculations. Now, um, a denarius was a day's wages. And, and, and Philip says that not even 200 denarii, 200 days wages would be enough to feed this crowd, that they would not be sufficient. And Andrew, he considered, you know, we have a little, but, but the need is so big. He connected with the boy and his lunch, and I sometimes wonder about what kind of conversations they, they might have had since Andrew, at one time, you know, prior to becoming a disciple and following Jesus, he and his brother Peter had been fishermen, and maybe he'd shared some fish stories with, with this boy, but in, in some way, he had connected with this boy, and he knew that this boy had a, a lunch. But what was that among so many? All these people out away from the cities and the villages, and, and they're hungry. And it appears that this boy was willing to share what he had, but again, little for so many. There was not a plan to gathering that this just happened. And one of the signs, uh, one of the signs perhaps of a people who needed a shepherd. And Jesus needed to be recognized as that shepherd. So we then see the provision that is made by Jesus as we move on in verses 10 to 14. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. And Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed is the, this indeed, this is indeed the prophet who is come into the world. 
As we consider Jesus' actions here, as he had the people uh, sit down, Jesus, again, Jesus knew what he was doing according, was going to do according to verse 6. But he went about the situation as, as it seems anyone would with commonplace happenings, with calmness and, and confidence in providing uh, for them. Matthew's account, Matthew 14, 21, tells us that there was 5,000 men plus women and children. Mark 6, 44 tells us 5,000 men. Luke 9, 14 and John 6, 10 here uh, just mention 5,000 men. But whether it's 5,000 or 5,000 plus, what a great need to, to fill with, with so little. But Jesus gave thanks. It is said that the Jews considered it was stealing from God to eat without first offering thanks. And, and it seems that Jesus always offered thanks, as we also should also always offer thanks for what we have received as we enjoy it. But he had the food distributed. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account revealed Jesus gave it to the disciples and had them distribute it among the crowds as they were sitting there grouped on the grass. And then he encouraged, verse 12, for there to be no waste. In wastefulness, we see that what was provided was not to be taken for granted, as oftentimes the case is, especially when something is easily uh, provided. You know, if one can provide so easily, you know, why, why worry about picking up the, the rest? But we see that Jesus urges that nothing would be lost, that nothing would be wasted. And we find then that the, the small proved to be sufficient, which was proof, again, of Jesus' ability as the great provider. The point of the miraculous provision was not that each had some, but the fact that each had enough. As the text says, they had eaten their fill. There was sufficient, and the fact that they picked up some reveals there was more than sufficient on this occasion. All were satisfied. Nothing was wasted. One commentator writes, one would think when things come apparently so easily... There would be little use for saving, but God does not allow wastefulness at any time. Nature wastes nothing. Soil washed from the hills and mountains, God catches in the valleys and low places. It is the waste of man that brings want. Isn't that so true in this world today? The waste of man that, that provides or that leaves others in want. But the people were impressed, and, and who wouldn't be impressed with, with such a provision as this? And there's, there's something about this that, Lord willing, we'll be noting uh, next, next week. But, but they were impressed. Another miraculous sign. Here was another work, as we noted last week uh, in John 5, 36, that, that testified as to who Jesus was, as to who Jesus is, that he was from Father, another sign that was showing as, as the works testified, they were a witness as to who Jesus was. Not just the works, not just the Father, and not just the scriptures, that threefold witness, but again, a sign of the works showing who Jesus is and, and was. And their response is, this in, is indeed the prophet. Perhaps thinking of Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19, where we read, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak in them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Though Joshua was the immediate one to follow 
and the steps of, of Moses as the leader of the nation of the Israel, this, this may be one of those prophecies that also looks toward the coming of the Messiah, the one who was to be, listen, the one who was to be followed, the one who would be sent and provided for by God. A great need, but sufficiently met by the Lord. Oh, what God can do with the inadequate. And we need to keep that in mind as we continue to live our, our life because it, it's what God does. It, many examples from Scripture, as we see here in John 6, Jesus using a boy's lunch to feed 5,000 plus people. But also in Exodus chapter 4, verse 20, and chapter 7, verses 8 through 9, and, and 17 and 9, as, as uh, the rod of Moses used by, by Aaron and, and God, uh, called the, the, the rod of God or the staff of, of God that was used to show the power of God before Pharaoh. And think of uh, 1 Samuel 17, 40, and, and David who picked up the five smooth stones as he went out uh, against Goliath, but only one stone was really needed in, the, in that great victory that God brought through David that day. And then think of uh, during the days of, of, Eli of Elijah, verse King 17 and, and uh, verse uh, 40, uh, excuse me, first King 17, verse 12, uh, Elijah and, and the widow of Zarephath and her son where her oil, handful of flour and the oil were, were enough to keep them going through the famine and et cetera, other situations that, that uh, arise. But one, one more thing, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. Think about our own lives and, and how God makes adequate even that. Remember, as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that it is, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We need to acknowledge what God can do, and it's not because what we have is so great and, and so much, or even that we ourselves are so great or are, are so much, but because he is and what he can do, he can work through us. You know, sometimes, and, and, and it's happened on more than one occasion, when, when someone has, has said to me, I see Jesus Christ in you. And, and then I think about myself and I know where I'm struggling in, in my own life. And as we think of ourselves as, as jars of clay and, and the fragileness of, of life, and yet God dwells in us by his spirit and God is, is willing to use us. And, and, and recently I was thinking of, of myself as a cracked pot. And yet if Jesus is, is in me, that in spite of that crack, that Jesus can shine through that crack and be seen. And, and when I was thinking about that, thinking of it from the standpoint that in spite of my imperfections, in spite of my struggles, I need to recognize that Jesus still wants to use me and Jesus still can use me. And in spite of my imperfections, it is Jesus that truly needs to be seen in my life. And I need to keep surrendering more and more to what he is going to do through my life. And, and not let my frustrations, not let my feelings of, of inadequacy or the things that I'm struggling with and, and even my perspectives to, to keep me from continuing on in his work. God so desires to use us in his life. God can and God does desire to use us. God uses ordinary people to carry out his extraordinary plan. Isn't that amazing? 
that he wants to use us in that way. We may fall short in and of ourselves, but God doesn't when we willingly surrender to his use. And by grace, we become. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10, there Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, you are what you are. Let God use you. Let that grace be powerful in your life. But he makes us competent for his work. Paul recognized that in his life as he expressed it in 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Paul saw the sufficiency. Paul saw his competence as coming from God to carry on the mission that was his, the, the ministry of Christ and sharing uh, the gospel of Christ. It was not, he had not become competent in himself, but the competence came from God. And we need to be willing to be led then by him. Again, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 16. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to, to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Yeah, who is sufficient? Well, again, the Lord brings the sufficiency into our life. And we need to trust him in that. But he leads us in triumphal procession. It is, and we don't smell the same to the world. Some are going to accept us, and some are going to reject us. But yet we need to carry on as the Lord leads us on and sharing the gospel with the world around us. God can give life where there is no life. We see that uh, with Abraham and, and Sarah, whose bodies were just noted as being as, as good as dead, but God brought life. He fulfilled his promise. We need to look to him for continuing to fulfill his promises, to trust that he has the ability to do that. God can give hope where there is no hope because he is the God of hope and provided through Christ a living hope that is ours. Have we surrendered to trusting God's sufficiency? As we look at the, the record, uh, God's track record of provision, and look at our Lord's provision of both the physical and spiritual blessings, let us trust in that sufficiency and surrender our life more fully to Him. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, uh, 6 to 8. We read there, the point is this, and here Paul was, was writing and encouraging as they were taking up a collection for uh, needy saints in, in Judea. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And note verse Eight here. But God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Let us trust God in that. As we give of our means and as we give ourselves, let us trust God for the sufficiency to continue carrying out His will continuing to carry out his work. May we continue to trust what God is able to do through the giving of what we have and the giving of ourselves according to his will as we engage in his work. I will trust in God's provisions. Will you? Will you trust in God's provisions? Surrender to him and allow him to continue 
His great and marvelous work through your life.